So from the perspective of research, if you don't communicate what you've done so that other people can think about it, build on it, use it in their own careers, you might as well have not done it at all. And we use peer review to somehow give you the sense that you really did have a right to claim that discovery as yours. So you use reviewers to somehow be able to help you, help the journal assess whether you get to make that claim of the discovery. So journals use it, as I said, to find out whether you have a right to make that claim. And in the basic sciences, we would say whether the conclusions you draw from your research, but I think that's true too in the humanities, whether you justified them through analysis or through data gathering and whether they're new, whether there's, it changes somehow the way people who un, who've thought about this field for a long time think about the problem. Um, and then to get some gauge as to, okay, if it's both believable and new, that it's important. And that's a kind of much slipperier slope there, kind of because, you know, what's important is, you know, what we find interesting. And what we find interesting depends very much on who we are and what we find interesting. So that's a kind of harder one to get handled. But I think everybody asks reviewers to do some sort of assessment of that. My perspective, having seen lots of reviews in journals like Cell and PLOS Biology, and the journals I work on now, Jason and DMM, is that the methodological issue, which is a really important one, often is missing from a review that I see. When you get to some of these really high, certainly at the kind of highest profile journals, they tend to think, well, if I don't see it as a cell paper, I don't even have to think about the methodology. And so there are a lot of journals, and the reviews become dismissive. And the reason for that being dismissive, um, we can, I think we, is worth discussing. And these days, and it wasn't true when I started in research, there seems to be a request for additional work. Oh, I mean, I've seen in the past decade, I can count on my hands the number of times I've accepted a paper, or reviewers have recommended that a paper be accepted without revision. And I have handled something like 10,000 papers in that period. Um, and so when reviewers ask for additional work, editors tend to just follow um, that request. And I think there is an inherent fear, particularly at high stature places in, bio, in basic science where the editors are not full-time academics. It, I think it's particularly true there. There's a real fear of publishing. Publishing is a public act. Everyone knows when you publish something that turns out to be flawed. A lot of editors will just insist that every reviewer gets satisfied to the nth degree, and so that can really slow the process down. And if the paper is rejected after two or three rounds of review, which happens not unusually in journals like Nature and Science and Cell, then it starts all over again. Well, one of the things that editors need to, need to do is sort of recognize if they're going to use peer review, that their reviewers are biased, that they're specialized in particular areas, and to read the reviews remembering why they sent that paper to that reviewer to begin with. Right? And so really it play the role of interpreter and not just say, well, there are negative comments here. And I think one of the things reviewers tend to do is feel they have to comment on everything and they will act as experts for things they really don't know that much about. And there too, editors need to say, okay, I'm going to discount this negative comment because without understanding how this person, that wasn't why I sent this paper. So you really have to somehow have a rubric to assess the Reviews And I think editors, by and large, don't do that anymore in many, many fields. Reviewers can do certain things, but they shouldn't be the ones to make the decisions. That's the editor's job. And I think you need, editors really do need to consciously and explicitly relieve reviewers of that expectation. So when I write letters to reviewers now, I say, I'm not asking you to tell me whether to publish this paper. I want to remind you that you, know, you can help me make that decision, but you're, you don't, I don't expect you to know what we're going to publish or know what else we're doing be wary of all kinds of bias, and to maintain a group of people you trust that are really committed to the journal, whether it's your own internal editorial team or a handful of people who function as academic editors for the journal. They can't be on every editorial board. They have to be committed to you in a handful of places so they can really think about what is this journal trying to achieve and how does this paper match what we're up to and what we're trying to do. Um, you need to give clear advice you need to provide clear and constructive decisions to authors, and you need to recognize that actually your duty is to publish, <laughs> um, and that you don't want to hold, I mean, I found my, it took me a decade, I have to admit, to where I didn't just ask for an experiment because I knew it would make the paper better. It would be better for Cell, 
if we had a better paper. But it's not necessarily would shift it from publishable, not publishable, but publishable, which is the threshold that I should be thinking about. Um, it would be, you know, you know, and that's, and I think that's something a lot of editors don't think about because it's scary to publish. And ethically, you need to listen to appeals. You know, it is true that editors, although they can be very clear about what their journal's about, are almost by definition not going to be expert in the papers that they're assessing and making decisions on. And they may be following a line of logic, and you'd be willing to, you know, kind of be clear about what your, the logic is that led you to that decision. It may rely too heavily on something that the field knows isn't reproducible or you know, and therefore shouldn't be held in quite the same way. So I think that's ethics. And so one thing I've been toying with is whether you can actually create a system that does what I call journal blind peer review. A group of journals that are in the same field, um, all quality journals, um, slightly different standards of significance or what they're after or whatever, um, you don't know which journal it's at. And maybe that will help you stay away from this, your own experience at the journal. And the reason I think about this and why I expect that it would help is my experience launching new journals. And so, the, of course, this is just anecdote, but I remember in the early days of every journal I've ever launched, um, when I've sent papers for review, reviewers would come back and say, I don't know what to advise you because I don't know what you're publishing. I guess I'll just have to stick to the strengths and weaknesses of this paper and let you decide. <laughs> I'd say, thank you, <laughs> that's all I want, you know. And at the same time, um, authors would come to me, whether the paper was accepted or rejected, and say those were the most constructive reviews I'd ever seen. And so I have this suspicion, but as a scientist by training, I want some data, that if we could keep this out of the view of the reviewer, they'd do a better job. In, in social work and uh, social sciences, I think that uh, perhaps that's a different concern than in some medical sciences in the sense that my community of scholars, uh, you know, we're talking about randomized clinical trials around HIV prevention interventions or uh, intimate partner violence prevention or treatment programs. And really those that are making access to the the academic journals and the empirical knowledge are not the same people who are practicing that in the field. So this is not just a problem of peer review. This is actually why NIH is entirely restructuring their peer review system and their um, relative value as they look at what it is that they're going to fund moving forward from 2010 is that we're really not doing perhaps enough innovative and impactful work. Um, we're keeping the academic machine going and we are building knowledge and again this is different because I think in medicine it's harder to sort of see that spinning wheels doing lots of efficacy trials and you know we can say for the hundredth time we found one more program to help reduce um, to help increase condom use and reduce risk well it's, it's really time to move that to evidence uh, to effectiveness and dissemination research and our journals have been developed in the last two or three decades around best evidence but what happens is then all the reviewers that are part of the system of support for best knowledge are kind of stuck in that place of the randomized trial is the gold standard and these are the methods that we should be looking for in our review. So there's not as much room for innovation, um, a changing way of, of looking at how we might solve some of the problems. The other thing that I'm very concerned about in terms of the peer review system, again, is how we shift it, and I don't think it's specific to peer review, but how we shift it to reach more of the practitioners, how we actually take uh, what it is that we're publishing in our peer reviewed journals, and are we including in the peers who are part of the uh, review boards practitioners who are in the field who actually could speak more to how we translate from science to from bench to trench, right, from, um, from the science to the practical application. One of the interesting um, themes that ran through, I think, the presentation was this whole issue of bias. And I think you're absolutely right. It is everywhere in the process, and um, what makes it problematic is we assume that it's not. So we imagine a process that is bias-free, and yet we're, we're encountering it at, at every step, and we're encountering it at all of the junctures. So not just in the obvious places, but in, 
in difficult places. Uh, so for example, um, it's very clear to me from lots of editing that an editor can predetermine the outcome of any submission um, just by the reviewers that they select. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, I think editors are not as, a, as aware of that fact um, because, of course, once you get the reviews back that you expect, you're reinforced in your in initial notions of the paper and you believe that, in fact, we've got this objective and lovely process.